And now we come to the anime of the decade of the 2000s. If you recall from the 1990s, the popping of the Japanese economic bubble caused a reduction in budgets in the anime industry. But those had been shored up partially by sales in North America, which had gotten really, really large over the 90s. Uh, unfortunately, that was about to change around the year 2000, and really because of two things. One was the rise of fan subs. Fan subs have been around for a long time, well before the year 2000, but it was around this period that fan subs could be produced and distributed quickly and easily and cheaply on the internet. Before then, you had to um, you know, master your, your subtitles onto tape. It was a really long and complex process. With digital, suddenly now you could, um, or a group could actually produce fan subs for a show that was airing in Japan and have it turned around and available on the internet within a couple of days. And this was really, really, really new. What this, this caused among some fans was to turn away from buying anime on uh, VHS tape or disc and instead just watching fan subs. As one anime fan at the time uh, said to me, why would I pay for something that I can get for free? And this uh, obviously had an impact economically. The other, then the second major uh, impact is that because uh, North American money was helping to kind of shore up budgets, the Japanese companies started raising the prices of their licenses and started charging more and more for anime from the American uh, companies. And unfortunately, with lowering sales in North America, that, that was not sustainable over time. So uh, quite a few North American licensing companies went bankrupt during this time, went out of business because they just could not afford to keep um, uh, you know, paying for uh, all these things and they weren't getting enough money to, to actually keep things going. Um, and so this led to a crash where suddenly now the North American money was greatly reduced and there was, you know, that, that, was, that left the Japanese anime industry really in a bind. Where were they going to get this money? So imagine being an animator working at an anime studio at this point. The industry is certainly, you know, robust. It's been around for decades. Um, you've been very experimental in the 90s, but it's really not a time for that anymore. It's really tough to make ends meet at this point at an anime studio. So when you're choosing on the next show to make, to, to make you want something that's sure to be successful. Maybe not, you know, shoot the moon successful, but something that is going to keep everyone, you know, employed. <laughs> it's pretty important. So you suddenly become more conservative, not in the political sense, but in the sense of looking for more tried and true things. And so the industry looked to a rising phenomenon elsewhere, the rise of visual novels. And I think it is the anime adaptation of To Heart in 1999 that really heralds this. Uh, if you're not familiar, visual novels are these very simple computer games, kind of like choose your own adventure stories typically. Uh, almost always using anime style art and usually having or commonly having some kind of a dating theme where you're a uh, uh, guy surrounded by cute girls or a girl surrounded by hot guys or whatever uh, and your choices determine who you end up with. And these were getting hugely, hugely popular. We started seeing anime adaptations of that, particularly with To Heart, and when you think about it, adapting a visual novel is a pretty safe bet. You already have your plot, you already have your characters, you already have your voice actors, because these games were voiced, and so you didn't have to cast anybody new. Um, you already had your character designs, obviously they'd be you know, adapted for anime, different medium, but still. Um, a lot of your work was already done for you when adapting a visual novel, so they were much less expensive to adapt than other media, certainly novels, even manga. So you start seeing the anime industry adapting a lot more visual novels throughout the 2000s. Uh, indeed, this kind of solidifies with the uh, adaptation by Kyoto Animation of Air, Canon, and Clonade starting in 2005. Uh, three hugely successful visual novels from Key Visual Arts and uh, being made by one of the rising stars of the anime industry at the time. And this really um, was a highlight for how important this was. These visual novels had a particular art style and a particular approach to them 
that uh, then made its way into the anime industry with a term we call moe. You may have heard this term before, and the, the term's actually evolved over, uh, uh, over the years. It's been around since before the 2000, uh, where it's meant different things. For our purposes, moe simply means um, a, creating a sense of protectiveness for another character. So a, a, a character who is moe is a character that you want to help and to protect and to have kind of a, that, you know, defensive, protective instinct for. And these visual novel adaptations in particular very much had this feeling for a lot of the characters. And so you saw the rise of this moe era, if you will. And you see just tons and tons of these adapting, being adapted in this period. Uh, a great example is Strawberry Marshmallow, anime series about cute little girls doing cute little things. Very fluffy, very light, very simple, you know, modern day slice of life kind of a series. Nothing really, you know, no big save the day thing happening here. Uh, but it's a kind of a simple, nice, safe bet. Uh, and this is something that the anime industry really had to do to stay afloat. Adapt things that already had a built-in audience, that were already, um, already going to show up for that adaptation. Uh, and they were also easier to adapt. Now, this is not the only thing happening during this decade. The 2000s also see the rise of the Big Three Shonen series. Uh, One Piece starting in 1999, Naruto in 2002, and Bleach 2004 in anime form. Uh, these were three very long-running shonen series. And I want you to, to imagine, before these series came out, a shonen series would come out for a season or two, maybe three or four, and that would be it. Uh, even Dragon Ball Z you know, didn't last for decades. Uh, it came out, and then it stopped. Um, all, all the other shonen series before that might have you know, uh, 50, 100, 150 episodes, but then they would stop. Suddenly, these series were coming out for years and years and years and building up hundreds of episodes. Very different approach, and heralded very, a, a very different um, uh, type of shonen series. And again, this is a sort of a, a, a shift to a different model, a more conservative model, where instead of trusting that people are going to come back to you with your new concept every year or two, you're giving them the same thing over and over, you, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year. Um, and it was, it was a sign of stability, a sign of something that was going to be here, uh, you know, when you grow up. You know, you'll, you'll always have uh, Monkey D. Luffy or Naruto or Ichigo. Uh, but of course, nothing stays the same forever. And you start seeing the beginning of that, that transition, actually in 2006, I believe, with The Melancholy of Haruhi Susan Mia. Uh, an anime series that adapted some, some light novels, actually. And Haruhi is important because it was also by Kyoto Animation that had done these, these adaptations of Air Cannon and Clonade. But also, it was a, um, a parody of Moe. It made fun of all these Moe archetypes and this fact that um, all of these shows were having all of these you know, archetypical uh, cute girls in them. And it was hugely popular, hugely successful. And this really indicated that both the anime industry and anime fandom were ready to move on from Moe. Not that they wanted to, Moe to completely go away, but that it was time to evolve the medium a little bit. And yeah, 2006 is kind of early in the decade, but really the Moe phenomenon doesn't really last for a, you know, a full 10 years. It doesn't map to the decade precisely. But I think 2006 is where you start to see shifts and where you start to see people start to change what they're doing with, or, or wanting to change what they're doing with the, the Moe concept. Uh, and so you would start to see some changes uh, later on, but that is what we're going to cover in the next video about the 2010s.